our medical system is designed to treat people after they get sick rather than prevent people from getting sick. So, so we need to re, you know, reverse how we fund healthcare, right? I almost think we've come to assume that these are inevitabilities of life. Yeah. We'll get cancer. Yeah. One of us will get, yeah. someone in here is going to get Alzheimer's. And that's the way we live. So we're, we're, we're preparing to medicate when that day comes. That that's right. I get, God forbid, diagnosed with something that's absolutely right. In fact, that's what medical students today are taught, right? If you go to medical school today, <clears throat> you're taught that as people get older, their blood pressure goes up. I can tell you that's just not true. It's in the Western world where people are physically inactive and eat crap diets that their blood pressure tends to go up. But there are plenty of people, I'm actually one of them, right, who don't have high blood pressure as they age. And guess what? <laughs> what's the best way to prevent getting high blood pressure as you age? It's, um, you know, I sound like a broken record, but we have this idea that as you get older, yes, you're going to, and we're lucky, right? You know, because we don't die from smallpox when we're 30. We're lucky to get cancer when we're 60, right? What we've done is we've confused diseases that are more common with aging with age being a cause of those diseases in the first place. And they're not inevitable, inevitable diseases. Um, and many of them are preventable. And, and the problem is that in our society, we, we don't value prevention very much. We, we may talk about it, but we don't really put our money where our mouth is, right? In the US, which is arguably one of the worst healthcare systems, it is the worst healthcare system among the industrialized Western world, we spend approximately 3% of our budget, our medical budget on prevention. And yet when people walk into a doctor's office, 75% of the time the disease is according to the Center for Disease Control, a preventable disease. So we essentially spend nothing to prevent diseases that overwhelm our system and cause enormous amounts of misery. It's a completely backward, stupid system. And so, and, and the good news is it's not that hard to prevent a lot of these things. Um, um, it takes willpower and um, it takes education and it takes access to, to good quality food and whatever. Um, but um, uh, so, on the one hand, it's very depressing. On the other hand, the optimist in me says, you know, we really can do something. And people, even if without, even if they're not wealthy or whatever, I mean, there are simple things that everybody can do to improve their health outcomes. These diseases we we encounter today as we age, and just generally in our society, when you look at hunter gatherer hunter gatherer communities, or you look at certain tribes around the world, maybe in Africa, do you see the same um, the same types of diseases in the same um, occurrence level of occurrence or is there some diseases which just don't like i'm wondering if like if because you know cancer seems to be so popular for example as, as a disease and alzheimer's and these kinds of things so i wonder has that always been the case throughout human history and is that the case in other parts of the world that's such a good question so first of all some of these some of these diseases are really hard to to measure in non-Western populations because we don't have the diagnostic tools. So nobody really knows how common cancer is in, in, in a lot of parts of the world, right? There's just no, the data don't exist. That said, when you make estimates and you do look at the studies that are out there, and even if you look in, in, in historical records in, in places like Europe where people have been keeping track of this, there is no question that cancer rates have been rising and that cancer rates are much, much more common in the Western world. There's a strong association between cancer and wealth. And that's because cancer is basically a disease of energy, right? When your cells, because cancer is basically natural selection gone awry in the body. It's when cells start competing with each other uh, in ways that uh, that cause uh, basically and, and start you know going you know multiplying and dividing out of control, right? It's a kind of natural selection. And what is it that those cells are doing? They're competing for energy. And when you have more energy, like when you're eating more and being less physically active, you can you basically feed those cells. So um, so, cancer, so uh, high levels of insulin. Insulin is highly uh, related to, to cancer. High insulin levels are, are, are carcinogenic. Um, high levels of, of body, of, of energy, you c cause women, for example, to increase the, the amount of estrogen and progesterone that they produce. Men produce more testosterone. These are, and these are, these are m hormones that, um, of course, are for good for reproduction, but they're, but Again, we evolved, we evolved to be to have as many babies as possible, right? But that doesn't mean that translates into health, right? So more estrogen, more progesterone increases risks of, say, breast cancer. More testosterone increases the risk of prostate cancer. So if you look at most diseases, right, people are more physically active. They have lower levels of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. They have lower levels of insulin. They have lower levels of blood sugar. All of these depress cancer rates. And on average, people who are physically active have much lower rates of almost every single kind of cancer that you can think of. 
women who walk 150, you know, get 150 minutes of physical activity a week have on average about 30 to 50% lower lifetime breast cancer risks than people who are sedentary. And yet, for some reason, this is not a well-known fact. Um, and, and we understand we have we have epidemiological data, we have mechanistic data, we understand how and why it works. And yet, and yet, how often do you hear about cancer prevention? We talk about treating cancer, which is all important. If I get cancer, I would like it treated too. Thank you very much. But why don't we spend more energy and activity and 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 have more education about how to prevent cancers in the first place? Physical act. I've, I mean, I've never heard that before. So that's that's really helped me um, to add more value to exercise in my mind. You're talking there about insulin levels and how that has there's a link between your insulin levels and your chances of getting cancer. Sugar, glucose, inflammation, bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, look, if you want to, if you want to take like the three things you should, you know, if you really care about your health, don't smoke, right? That's kind of obvious. I think everybody knows that. Get some exercise. I don't think you need me to tell you that, right? And, and cut down on sugar and foods that are high in sugar and low in fiber, right? That, you know, what we call high glycemic foods. Those are the foods that elevate your, 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 your blood glucose levels, your, your insulin levels shoot up and insulin Insulin, the basic function of insulin is, is, to, is it's, it's what we call an ana anabolic hormone. It's, its job is to, is to store energy. Right? Glucose. Glucose, but also fat. Okay. All right. Okay. So in, insulin, what insulin does is to get energy into cells. So it's like a taxi. It's like an Uber. It's like a taxi, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's not a taxi. It's like a, it's telling other cells to do that. So insulin, for example, binds to other cells that are the actual taxis. So it's like okay. it's like calling the Uber, I would say, okay. maybe, right? Um, and um, and insulin is is you know it's the fundamental. So when you when you eat food, insulin levels go up because its job is to store that energy. And when you exercise, insulin levels go down because because you want to then use that energy, right? So so uh, so. When cells get more energy, they're more prone to going out of control, basically. And, 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 and inflammation is caused by, basically by getting, you store so much fat in your cells that those fat cells start to swell. And when those starts to swell, like anything, right, they start to rupture, they get damaged. And that damage attracts the immune system and the immune system gets turned on and that causes inflammation. So, so too much adiposity, too much fat, you know, over swollen fat cells is the is a primary cause of systemic inflammation, and inflammation is like the slow burn in our bodies that causes widespread damage to pretty much everything you can think of. And it turns out that so the two ways to deal with inflammation are one to prevent it, right? So don't eat foods that are pro-inflammatory, like anything with a lot of sugar, basically, right? I mean that you know the sugar is highly inflammatory, um, or trans fats are highly inflammatory, but also turns out, and many people don't know this, but you also want to turn down your immune system, right? You want to turn the dial down. And I don't know, I'll just give you one guess what it is that does that. Exercise. Exercise. And the, and, and, the, and the way it does that is that when, you, when you're physically active, you're using your muscle cells. It turns out muscles are also an endocrine organ. Your muscles are producing a molecule called interleukin-6, IL-6, that in low levels is pro-inflammatory, but at high levels, it's actually anti-inflammatory. It turns down inflammation. And your muscles, because a third of your body is muscle, right? When you go for a run or, or swim or bike ride or whatever, you're producing a ton of this stuff and it turns down levels of inflammation. So people are physically active, even if they're overweight, are actually controlling and regulating their inflammation. And we never evolved to regulate inflammation because in this way, because we never evolved to be physically inactive. Until recently, nobody was physically inactive, until they, unless they were dying, right? So, so we never evolved an alternative mechanism to regulate our inflammation other than physical activity. And we didn't live in a world with this much sugar. We never lived in a world. I mean, it's astonishing. You, have, you pay more money for foods today that have less sugar added. <laughs> right? I mean, that's just ridiculous, right? Because it's so cheap. And sugar is, you know, we love, everybody loves sugar. I mean, I've, um, I've gone hunting with um, hunter gatherers, you know, you know, foraging oh, really? hunter gatherers. And, um, and I can tell you that they're honey addicts, right? I mean, I've gone out with these guys and they go from, you know, if, if, they, if they fail on their hunt, like by 10 or 11, if you haven't killed an animal, you know, that's it for the day, right? And then 
it, com- it, it turns from being a hunting expedition to a honey collecting expedition. And they'll go from hive to hive to hive, get smoke, burn out the bees, and just gorge themselves on more honey than I could possibly imagine to eat. Except these are lean, physically active hunter-gatherers, and they, they handle it just fine. Um, but it's, you know, it's, the, it's the Paleolithic equivalent of you know, eating Mars bars all day long. But they've been out doing physical activity for how long? Yeah, I mean, the average day is about 15 kilometers of, of walking with some running. Yeah, so, so, so they're, you know, they, can, they, can, they can cope with it. How many hours is that? Oh, that's two to three hours, probably. Okay, so from that, I <coughs> have garnered that I need to do 15 kilometers a day for two or three hours every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, it's not a prescription, right? So that's a, kind of like the paleo fantasy, sort of naturalistic fantasy, that if you live like a hunter-gatherer, somehow your, your, your world will be perfect, right? Mm. That's basically what the paleo diet is sort of all about, right? And that's not true either. Yes, you need to be physically active, but it turns out that a certain amount, you know, if you're any any physical activity is better than none, right? And if you look at the kind of any curve of any output, any health 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 outcome, like how many years you live, or whether you're less likely to get cancer or heart disease or whatever, you know, any little physical activity, your curve starts to fall quickly, right? Your your likelihood of cardiovascular disease starts just you know a few minutes a day of exercise has big benefits. But eventually that curve flattens out, right? And it flattens out well before the hunter-gatherer level. So you don't need to be a hunter-gatherer in terms of physical activity to get the benefits. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.